Yes, we're still live at the Congress Hall of the Transco Hilton Hotel, where the 20th edition of the National Economic Summit is taking place, focused on transforming the education sector through um, partnerships and global competitiveness. Now, I have someone here who's been working with um, students in the northern part of the country specifically, but I know she's been working with students around the country in the area of education development. Let's talk about access to education, Mariam. Orgi, that's the pronunciation, right? Yes. Okay. Good. You, you, you've been talking about, you've been working with students around the country, particularly in the northern part of the country. Let's talk about faith-based education. How, do you, how has it been and how has it helped accessibility to education? Um, when it comes to faith, you see, when it comes to faith-based, it's a very dynamic and, and social issue where you have to be very careful in which angle you approach it. Um, some of these people are very sensitive about the issue and there's a misconception towards what education is and what education should be when it comes to faith. So what we try as much as possible to do is liaise with the traditional leaders and also their religious leaders because what happens is as a female going into traditional uh, uh, setting and wanting to talk to them without having the backing of the male or without having the backing of the traditional leaders, it doesn't really make that much of an impact rather than having their traditional leaders or their, their religious leaders telling them, listen, there's an importance to this, there's a reason why you should be doing this. And it, it makes more of a significant impact if you partner with them in getting through, getting the message through some of these students. Okay. Now, how would it help? Now, we're talking about moving the education sector forward, seeing that you have, they have this challenge with the people working with the traditional rulers. How would it help to move the education in that area? I mean, I'm talking about 10.3 or they're about out of school. The statistics, some say is wrong, some say is right. But how do we, how would we move them forward? Um, could you rephrase that question? I didn't get that. The statistics we have, 10.5 million out of school. Now, with this challenge you have about them not understanding or not or the misconception there is. Okay. So Now, what it is is parents don't see the long-term, like I said earlier, the long-term importance of education. These children don't see the long-term uh, importance of education. Even our generation, if you're being realistic, are more into the easy way of getting two things rather than the long-term effect of getting uh, the benefits of education. Now, what we try as much as possible to do is make them understand that you cannot get to where you're going to without a certain level of enlightenment. Now, education not just being the, the critical part of things, you also have to look at exposure. Some of these people are, uh, are educated, but when they talk to you, you wonder, where are you coming from? Exposure also uh, plays a very critical part it's been discussed. I went to a Unity school. I'm a product of the Unity school. And what we had while I was growing up is we were able to take excursions to places like Enugu, to places like Lagos, thereby interacting with different cultures and different religions and understanding how to move forward. You have kids who are stagnant in their communities, stagnant in the level of education that they get, stagnant in the way that their teachers teach them. To the teachers is not a, is not a, is not a fun job. It's a, it's a means of getting out of whatever uh, situation they are at that point in time. So I think there needs to be a very laudable advocacy in making sure that they understand there is a long-term importance to education rather than looking at it like a short-term basis. Nigerian education sector might be in dire need of help but i think individually we can also try as much as possible to see what we can do today if you go to your village and you encourage one child to go to school i believe you have done something if each of us collectively are to sponsor one child to school i believe we have done something and you never know what that it would almost be like a ripple effect because he would understand the importance of education so would the generation after him understand so i think it's a collective effort between all of us in making sure that these numbers come down Thank you very much. You very We're much. speaking with Miriam Augie of Ayahe Foundation. They're involved with um, accessibility to education, especially in the northern part of the country. I'm handing you back to Harriet Agwe right now, who will carry on with the other interview. Over to you, Harriet. Well, you're still watching um, the 20th uh, summit of the Nigerian Economic Summit on Education. And uh, as you heard New York say, uh, it's still we're still talking to some of the delegates and participants at the summit. I'm being joined now by Professor Hasana Alido. She's the director, UNESCO Regional Office, Abuja. Professor Alido, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Now, for most of yesterday and today, it seems as if um, everybody has the belief 
that this isn't just a government thing, that um, the private sector should also collaborate. Now you're the director of UNESCO regional office. How much collaboration can the private sector you know, have with the government in terms of improving education standards in Nigeria? I think uh, it is very important that we understand that uh, education is it, the whole society. Hmm. Starting at home, the community, the government, and of course the private sector. It's when you have very educated and skilled uh, lab, uh, labor that you can have a private sector. And so therefore it is very important that the private sector invest in education hands in hands with government and with the other uh, civil society organization. A few months ago, um, I was in Lagos the, uh, launching uh, at the launch of a uh, Shell education strategy. I believe this is one example of how a private uh, sector, uh, the oil sector, is saying we have to also do our part. And we would like to say uh, not only the oil sector, we want to look at the telecommunications sector because what, today we are consumer of ICT, we are consumer of telecommunication uh, goods like the telephone, and so uh, it's very important in all sectors, be it oil, be it agriculture, be it uh, telephone, be it uh, construction, all the private sector see that they have a corporate citizenship uh, and, to, uh, and they should contribute to education. Hmm. So every day, I'm sure you, are, you, you, know, you meet people who always talk about uh, the fact that there's, there's a lack of skills of graduates when, when they do come out, because we could have a professor who is so knowledgeable in so many things but might not have knowledge in the basic um, artisanship or whatever it is that he's, he's supposed to be the professor of. Mm -hmm. So I, I know I've already you know, spoken about this already, but we have a death of um, technical and vocational institutes. So what is UNESCO doing to ensure that all of these kind of institutions are put back on track? Because right now, what we need to at least grow this economy is uh, young people that have skills, you know, that can contribute to the, to the, to the economy as well. Uh, you are correct. Uh, today, we have uh, to recognize that technical and vocational skills are very, very re relevant. Uh, for uh, the growth of the economy. Not only we want people who are technicians, but we want engineers, but we have to look at also technical and vocational uh, uh, education is not only in the formal domain, but also in the informal domain. As UNESCO, we are trying hard um, to, to help government to look at really curriculum reforms, which promote learning of math and sciences, but also promote uh, technical and vocational education. Because uh, children are going to school, uh, some of uh, the children who are lucky, and even finishing, but uh, only having a bookish education mm. is not going to be helpful. So to recognize that a good quality curriculum to, uh, in today's uh, world is a curriculum which allows the person to be able to say that I have a good attitude, that is conducive to working together with, within a community of employees. But I have also skills that I can use, whether I create my own job or I can use the skills to work for somebody. So technical and vocational education, more and more we are looking at uh, and, and observing that government are recognizing from secondary education onward, they are promoting. I just came back from Liberia where the president President uh, Charlie Johnson, she launched her policy on Tibet, just to show you that it's important. I, w I was in Benin. Uh, Tibet was also technical and vocational education was something that they, they want to, to use as one aspect of uh, their curriculum uh, reform. So it's very critical that uh, we, we build uh, an education system that helps people to, to acquire the best attitude to work in a diverse world. Hmm. But also people who are competent, they have skills. Today, agriculture, uh, I watch TV a lot, and we are saying there is the oil sector, but uh, the majority of people live in rural communities, and agriculture is very fundamental to the economy. What are the technical skills in agriculture that the school system is helping 
learners to acquire so that they can be uh, really productive in that sector. The sector is economically viable, but one has to have the skills so that uh, you, you can use it uh, to transform. Professor Alidio, thank you so much for speaking with us uh, this afternoon on the, on the show. Well, I've been speaking with the director of UNESCO Regional Office uh, Abuja, Professor Hassana Alidio, and uh, she is also quite passionate about the fact that we should reintroduce technical and vocational uh, education institutions because these will ensure that the other sectors which we're beginning to move, which we, the government has begun to promote, particularly agriculture, will see people who can get the requisite skills in these institutions. Well, I'm going to be joined very shortly now by Otto Otto Orondam, he's the founder of Slum to School Project, and he's, he was also on, um, on the session that just okay. ended, the, the sixth plenary session that just ended, and uh, he's a founder of Slum to School Project, as I said, and he's going to be talking about um, children and um, the children in, in, in the slums and uh, how they've managed to ensure that uh, they get some form of education. Thank you so much, Otto, for, for joining us this afternoon. It's my pleasure. You were quite passionate during that session about the children who desperately need to be educated in the slums. Now, could you just give us an, a number of, um, on the percentage level, how many percent of children, particularly in the slums that you, you've had to you know, visit, how many of those children don't go to school? Okay. Um Slums are a very critical uh, part of our society, which we might never um, be able to just evict immediately. Now, we have realities in terms of poverty. We have realities in terms of you know, major issues that affect us in the society that makes you know, migration to the urban um, parts of the country very eminent. And um, you find out that in most of these communities where people cannot effectively get good housing, they have to go to slums. And the percentage of um, people who live in slums has been increasing drastically. Most of the people who live in slums are very poor. And we have slums around us. In every major city, there's a slum. There are slums in all parts of the country. It's not just in Nigeria, but across Africa, across the world, we have slums. But one of the things which I think we should really focus on is inclusiveness. How can we effectively include those guys in the process? Because most times when we talk about access to education, equity, and inclusiveness, we really do not consider the people who live in slums and, hard, and, and, and very hard to reach societies of hard to reach communities, villages. And we've worked in several communities, visited several slums across states like Lagos State and states in the north and also in the northwest and, 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 and southeast. And you find out that there are lots of communities where we have thousands of children who are out of school. So how can this begin to be addressed? Because you see, we know the challenges and uh, it's, not, um, it's not an individual thing to address. It's a collective collective way of, but we have to do a collective way of addressing it. So how can we begin to address this situation? So I think one of the major things we should be looking at is, which is very critical, is the fact that government needs, because as organizations like us, I, am, I'm, I, I run an organization called Slum to School Africa, where we have thousands of young people who volunteer and go into communities like this to advocate, sensitize, and address issues that affect education for children. You know, but as much as we do our best, as much as organizations, I know lots of other organizations driven by passionate individuals across the country. I have friends we visit communities like this, and we do our best. But as much as we do all of this, we still need the government, because the government is the only agency, the only driving force that can effectively and efficiently implement most of the policies. We've had several working groups in the past. We've had wonderful ministers in the past who have come up with policies. We've had technical committees that have reviewed policies across uh, education, and not much has been done in implementing them. And I think that's one of the important... Yesterday we were in a session where Pat uh, Professor Obanya talked about you know, the commission they worked on and um, how it has not effectively been implemented. And I think um, we need to start looking at the political will from governments, um, responsibles from ministers and, and people. In, and I know the government is doing its best, but we need to start implementing policies. We can do better as a nation because this involves the future of our nation. If we do not get it right now, it means our future will be wrong. And if our future is wrong, it means we are all threatened. So we can't even talk about socioeconomic stability and effective governance because most of the, of the fundamental factors are already wrong. Otto, thank you so much for speaking with us this afternoon. It's my, it's my pleasure. Well, I've been speaking to Otto Orodam. He's the founder of Slum to School Project, and uh, he's been quite passionate about, um, of course, everything that everybody has been doing. 48 hours, or 36 hours, is not to 48 hours just yet. And 
it's still the same thing. It's not all about talk. Let's match the, the talk with action. Even if you make the policies, let there be a driving force. Let there be an action plan to ensure that these policies are implemented. Because if they are implemented, then we'll be the better for it. Well, it's still the 20th Nigerian Economic Summit. It's happening here at the Transco Hilton Abuja. And uh, we'll quickly go back to Lagos and come back and continue because other sessions will still be ongoing.